Okay, guys, you remember our, what's our rule when we do this? What's my ask? That I don't do it by myself. Correct. So hopefully we will, uh, we will all do this together. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of one God, amen. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord bless us, amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now to the ages of all ages, amen. Make us worthy to pray thankfully, our Father who art in heaven. Our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Christ Jesus, uh, bless us. Let us give thanks to beneficent and merciful God, the Father of our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ. For he has covered us, helped us, guarded us, accepted us to himself, spared us, supported us, and had brought us to this hour. Let us also ask him, the Lord, our God, the Pontifex, to guard us in all peace and all, in all the days of our life. O Master, Lord, God, the Father, the Lord, the Father of our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, we thank you for everything concerning everything and in everything covered us, helped us, guarded us, accepted us to yourself, spared us, supported us, and has brought us to this hour. Therefore, we ask and entreat your goodness, O lover of mankind, to grant us complete this holy day and all the days of our life, all peace with your fear, all envy, all temptation, all the work of Satan, the counsel of wicked men, and the rising up of the enemies hidden in the manifest. Take them away from us and from your people, and from this holy place, that those things which are good and profitable do provide for us. For it is you who have given us the authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and upon all the power of the enemy. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through the grace, compassion, and love of mankind of your only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ, for whom the glory, the honor, the dominion, and the worship are due unto you. With him and the Holy Spirit and the giver of life, who is one essence with you, now at all times of the ages of all ages. Amen. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your great mercy. And multitude your compassions. Blot out my iniquities, cleanse me with my sin. Cleanse and my, my iniquity and my sin is at all times before me. Against you only have I sinned and done evil before you. Grant me my <coughs> and iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. For behold, you have loved the truth and have hidden my test of thing, the hidden and unrevealed things of your wisdom. Sprinkle me with hyssop, and I shall be purified. You shall wash me, and I shall be made whiter than snow. You shall make me to hear gladness, the humble, humble bones may rejoice. Turn away your face from my sins, and blot all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in the inward parts. Do not cast me away from your face, and do not remove your Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of salvation, and uphold me with your directing spirit. Then I shall teach transgressors your life, and shall... Deliver me from blood, O God, the God of my salvation. And my tongue shall rejoice of your righteousness. O Lord, open, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. I would have given it. Do not take pleasure to Zion. Broken spirit, a broken and a heart, God, you will not despise. Do go, Lord, or your pleasure to Zion. Let the walls of Jerusalem be built. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity that we may get up and worship into your house, Lord, and the way that the, the doors of your house is always open, Lord, and you're always willing to receive, Lord. And we ask that you receive us now. Not only do we ask that, we, that you receive us, Lord, I ask that you just lift us up, Lord. I ask that, uh, that your Holy Spirit fill this upper room right now, Lord. I ask that this message that's given today, Lord, is not something that falls on bad soil, Lord, but I ask that you just prepare our soil that it may bear fruit. Lord, I ask that this is a message that's going to wrestle with each one of us a different way, Lord, but I know that with the work of the Holy Spirit inside of us, Lord, that you will guide us to receive how it's meant personally, Lord. Not just something to be received, Lord, but your word is given to us for life change. So I ask that while I am sharing your message, Lord, that you are the one who is convicting and giving us practical steps in our life to know what you want from us in these coming weeks, Lord. The way that you want to be seen in our life, Lord, the way that you want to be manifested, Lord how we can be better followers, how we can be better listeners, how we can be better doers, Lord. But Lord, I ask that it starts right now in this meeting, Lord. So I ask that you wrestle with hearts, Lord. I ask that you give me the gift of prophecy that I may deliver your word to your people, Lord. And I ask that, that today be a day of change. And I ask this in your holy, precious name, lifted through the prayers and the sessions of your holy virgin mother, all your saints from our tears. Here's we pray one voice saying, thankfully, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for us the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> All right, I'm going to get straight into it because I know for whatever reason I just had this feeling that these kids are going to get out of Sunday school really fast and I'm not going to be done yet. And a reason of that is when I got this message, guys, I was like really excited and I try to keep it really, really short. But I will tell you that probably this is one of those ones where I'm going to use all of my time because I, I, it, I yeah, that's just how it's going to kind of go. So, um, oh, I was just wondering, like, what's my, <laughs> is that what I'm talking about? I think that's what I was talking about. Um, so I will, I'll start off by saying, how's you guys fast going? How many weeks are we in now? Three weeks, how many weeks do we have left? I think it's five. I was looking at the counter, I think it's five. Sorry, I probably shocked you because you're, if you were only hoping for three left, then I'm sorry, <laughs> so much longer. But um, so I, I was thinking about what we're gonna talk about today and, and honestly, we hear stories about fasting all of the time. Right, like yeah, the cynics are talks about it. When we talk about the saints, we talk about it. You read the book of Daniel, we talk about it. Like it's it's everywhere, right? And a lot of the times when we hear this concept of fasting, or when the church is getting ready for another fast, I will be the first one to tell you that I always think like, oh, fasting was something that was powerful back then, right? Like we had all of these great stories about how like you know the makatam and like how the mountain moved and like all of this other stuff when like fasting was implemented. And if I had to be honest with you guys, even my own life. Fasting was something that I always just struggled with. Um, and if I was honest with myself, what I started to realize is that fasting to me just turned into a, a time of dieting, right? Like you just figured out how do you make your nutritional variations and, and how you buckle down and you don't have meat. Um, but if we had to be honest with ourselves, and if that's where you are right now, thinking about how you fast, like we've got three weeks behind us, and I went and I wanted to challenge you and say over the last three weeks, you know, how would you describe your fast? And if it was just more of like a dietary change, then I'm going to challenge you on that because I don't think that's what the church was concerned, uh, concerned with. I don't think that was the point of it. Um, and when I was thinking about this, I came across this verse, Exodus 27. Um, it's, it's 2720. And let me put this, uh, the verse in context. Okay, so this is when God was telling the nation of Israel how to prepare the temple, right? And if you go through this passage of scripture, it's very, very intricate. You start realizing that God cares a lot about a lot of the small details. He cares about how it looks, how it should be prepared, like even down to every detail. And here he comes to address the lampstands, right? So just to wrap your mind around that, right? Like we're, we're building a church, right? Like if you go down to Peyton Avenue and Chino Hills, you're going to see we've got foundation up. We've got like some, some walls up. We've got like all of this other stuff up. And it's like, God is so detailed that while he's building, he's telling them, this is how you're going to build your church. He even dials it into the lampstands. Can anyone tell me anything about the lampstands that we have downstairs in the altar of the church? Unless you've served like as a deacon in the altar, I promise you, you probably never thought twice about it. Okay, but that's how intricate like God's plan for us is. And I love this verse. And it says, and you shall command the children of Israel that they bring you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to cause the lamp to burn continuously. Right. I'm going to say that one more time just because it wasn't smooth when I read it. You shall command the children of Israel that, that they bring you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually. Now, this is one of those verses that, is it easy to stroll right through that verse and to kind of just think, okay, cool, bring oil, let the lamps burn. All right, let's get on at it. But let me ask you this. How many of you guys, when you see that verse, think fasting? Yeah, at first it didn't for me either. I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you, okay? Um, but I started, started thinking, and I'm just going to ask you to like hear me out, right? So in the Old Testament, there was a tabernacle. Right? And what was the tabernacle? House of God is where the Spirit of God dwelt, right? Like that was where God was. Okay? Um, so let me ask you now is there a tabernacle today? Is that a yes or a no? I, it was kind of a, it was a slang, it was a yuppie or an opera, I couldn't tell. But <laughs> is there a tabernacle today? 
we are the tabernacles, right? Like if you go back to Jerusalem, is it there? Nope. A matter of fact, you'll find a mosque, right? Like that's a, that's a big diss, but, um, we are the tabernacle. Like that tabernacle is gone. Right. Um, so here's the thing is like, not only is there one tabernacle, but I would say in this room, you know, if I started counting, how many tabernacles are there in here? Because each one of us is a tabernacle of God. So if you think about it, right, God dwells in every single one of us. So this recipe that we're seeing in Exodus 27, 20, this is not an ex, this is not something that was left back, you know, when there was a tabernacle, but I think that it's a secret recipe for every single one of us today. So let's dive into that a little bit, right? What's the, what is the job of the lampstand in the tabernacle? This one should be an easy one. This is not a trick question. What is the job of the lampstand? Light, right? So there should be light, right? And it gives light where? In the darkness. Like the only time light is useful if there's an element of darkness, right? And I start thinking about, and then you start thinking about the Sermon of the Mount, right? You start talking about the passage where what are we called to be? light and salt, right? Like those are the two things that God tells us, hey, I need you to be these things, right? So the question is, is what does that look like so that we can be effective? Because if God is telling us to do something, there's always a purpose behind it. It's not just, hey, I just want you to be light, right? But there's a purpose to that light. And you start thinking about that. And, and the thing that hit me about that is to be both salt and to be both light, you have to be extremely different than your surroundings. Does that make sense? Like, think about it on food, right? Like, we'll start with salt. What makes salt, right? Salt is a seasoning, right? And what do you add it to? You add it to food that is bland, right? Now, here's the thing that <laughs> many people who prepare food don't get, okay? <laughs> but is it, is it a measurement? Like, is there a skill to having salt in your food? Bin Varka, yeah. So Meg's house has salty food. Okay. So but there's always there's always this aspect of like, you know, it's it's you have to be very, very careful, right? Because when you says that, oh, well, you add salt to food to make it taste good, right? Well, actually, when you when you taste just salt, does it taste good? No, it's extremely bitter, right? And actually, I can't stand it. I don't like salty food. It's only useful if you apply the correct amount, right? Same thing with light. If you think about light, well, there can only be light if there's an element of darkness. Like, it's funny. How many times have you had your iPhone, like, flashlight on and you don't even realize that someone else has to point it out? Because when you're in a bright room and there's a flashlight on, like, nobody even notices it, right? It only has its value when it's actually dark. Now, again, like salt, can too much light be bad? Everyone's thinking, eh. Well, I challenge you to go outside and stare at the sun, okay? Because it might not be as clear as an example, but too much light can also be bad, right? It has to be appropriate. And I will tell you, who, if, if you go back to Exodus, whose job was it to bring the light? It was the children of Israel's, right? I eat you and I. Like, that is our job now. And we're still responsible for the light. You know, now I'll be honest, it's not, we're not downstairs filling up like the lamp stands to make sure that it burns continuously like in the altar, but now it's our job to bear light continuously. That's, that's God's calling for us, right? We are lamp stands and we must bear the light of Christ sometimes, no, all the time. And when you say all the time, just to think about that, that also means everywhere you go because you're always continuously bearing light. Now, I will also throw on top of that, there's, a, an, a, there's an additional challenge in there that we have to bear the right amount of light. And how many of you guys have ever come across that person who's a little bit too much, right? And I don't want to say like they're too Christian because I don't think that's the right like characteristic of them, but they're just a little bit too much. And I will tell you, um, like, well, the most drastic example of it, has you ever been somewhere and someone's holding up the sign like, you're going to hell, right? Like the, the, the fire and brimstone preacher, right? Like, would you guys say that that's the right amount of light? Like, no. Matter of fact, I, I challenge to say if that's even light, right? And I get it. Like, it may be true, 
right? Like there might be people going to hell, right? We're all sinners. We all might be going to hell. I hope that some of us aren't. I hope I am not. Um, but it's not the way that Christ shined his light, right? So I would say that that's not the appropriate way of light. There's also this other type of guy, right? And this is the type of guy that I actually, I had one of these in my life. He was a really nice guy. I really, really liked him. The only example, the only issue with him was that nobody ever wanted to go to lunch with him. Right. Because if you went to lunch with him, he, if you were not like a practicing Christian, he was going to try to baptize you at lunch. Right. No, you think I'm joking. Right. But like literally people would be like, dude, and it was something at work. And they're like, dude, this guy's too much. Like, I don't want <laughs> like, I, it's just, he's too much. So you got to have like a tough conversation. Right. But I'll be honest, if we had to be like self-aware, I don't think those are the issues we're having. I don't think that we would be convicted of ish, like having too much light. Um, I think the issue is we might not be having enough light. And the same way that the lampstands were supposed to give light and give it continuously, so are we. And if we have the wrong amount of light, my guess is that we're not falling on the side of being too bright. So right now, I'm going to ask everybody just to shoot up a little arrow prayer and say, God, if this is true about me, I want you to convict me. If, if there's something off about where I'm at with my lampstand, if it's not burning correctly, if, it's not, if I'm giving off too much light, if I'm giving off too little light, I ask you con to convict me. Because until we are convicted about where we are at, we cannot move forward. And now that we got out of the way, I'm going to address this verse a little bit more because I think there's, there's a lot of beauty in this verse. Right. And I think that when it comes to this verse, there's a beauty of it. When, even when it comes into fasting, which should be something that directly hits home with every single one of us right now. And I will be very honest with you, especially this year. I was not very jazzed about fasting. Right. I was not excited about it. I was not looking forward to it. I literally felt like we just finished like the nativity. Like I was just like is and I think it even did start earlier this year than it usually does. But like I wasn't even in my stride of going back and getting like into like my regular gluttonous food. And then the next thing you know, it's time like Jonah's fast is here. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. So I was I wasn't feeling it. Right. Um, but then I remember like before I started fasting, like God was basically saying, Pete, dude, where where are you at? Right. Like, what, what are you doing? Do you remember like, do you remember before when you would look forward to the fasts? Do you remember before when there was like a tangible difference of like pre-fast Peter and like post-fast Peter, right? And then like you actually, you, you were doing it correctly and you started making it about spirituality and not just about diet, right? And you were, you know, step really pushing yourself that, it, you know, you're stepping away from things that you enjoy. And, and I'll be honest with you, especially today and like in the way that we're fasting now, how easy is it? to fast and actually not give up anything that you enjoy. And I'll be the first one to feel convicted about it, like the Beyond Burgers and the Impossible Patties and like all of this other stuff. Like we have like a full on menu of stuff that we can eat and we're still fasting. Like I don't wanna, like I, I'm convicting myself because if you go to my fridge, we have it, we eat it, we all that other stuff. But I'm telling you that like, you know, it's, it's just a little bit different. It's a little bit different. Because there's a part of it that's definitely dietary, right? Like we have to teach ourselves to say no to things that we really, really want. But I remember I was convicted about the other part of it. It says, hey, man, like are you stepping up in your quiet times? You know, are you reading your Bible more? Are you praying more, right? Are you setting an additional routine for yourself where you're setting that bar a little bit higher than you usually set it up for, right? Because, yeah, the dietary stuff is nice. But personally, if I was going to tell you guys like where I saw like huge areas of growth in my life, it's been, yes, I've been self-disciplined when it came to the food. But when you remove something, what do you have to do? You have to add something else, right? We got to add something else. And that was in my life where I started realizing when I started, you know, um, the, to really benefit from them fast. It's like, what are we adding? I fear a lot of us, what we do is we remove something and we add it with grumbling and complaining about everything that we, we were missing. But we're not stepping up on the other side of the board. And I came across this verse, and it was a beautiful verse because, you know, I've already read it. I'll read it again. It says, and you shall command the children of Israel, us, right, that they should bring pure oil of pressed olives for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually. And I love the first part of this that we're going to kind of spend a little bit of time on is that we're going to bring pure oil. And I thought that it's, it's like, all right, like no word wasted, right? Like, okay, let's dig into this, right? Like, why are we bringing pure oil? 
And I started thinking about that. And what the message is basically saying, what God is telling the nation of Israel, not any oil will do. Right? Like, don't think just because you, you have oil that you could just bring any oil. It needs to be pure. Now, for somebody who studies the Bible, oil in the Old Testament is a representation of what? The Holy Spirit. Right. So let's 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 expand on that. And guys, I'll tell you, Christine and I were just talking about this the other day to look at the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament is a complete game changer. Everything changes. Right. So even in a verse like this, or you think we're talking about oil in a lampstand. Right. You just think about all of the depth that it adds to it, because now knowing that he's basically saying, hey, bring up pure oil. But the oil is not about oil at all. It's about the Holy Spirit. That should blow your mind. Right. So why did it hit home? Because let me ask you. Your relationship with the Holy Spirit, how pure is it? How pure is it? See, because I'm not, I'm not telling you that you don't have the Holy Spirit. I believe that we all received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is inside every single one of us. I'm not telling you that, you know, the Holy Spirit doesn't direct you sometimes. I'm not telling you that sometimes that we don't submit to the Holy Spirit. But I'm going to ask you, is your relationship with the Holy Spirit Pure where it's strong, a lot of Holy Spirit, a high concentration of the Holy Spirit, your submission to the Holy Spirit, your obedience to the Holy Spirit, your listening to the Holy Spirit, right? Because there's one thing to have the Holy Spirit, and there's this whole other thing to have a pure relationship with the Holy Spirit. Um, it reminds me, one time I was having lunch, I used to be a part of this men's group where it was like four or five guys that would get together every Thursday, and there was one lunch where we were talking about... Um, revelations and, and like the seven seals of the end times. And the thing that we were talking about was in all of these seals, all of the stuff that was going on and all of these signs that were happening, but people would still not repent, right? Like they just, they just wouldn't repent. And it came about because one of the guys um, in the men's group, you know, his wife, a you know, good God fearing guy, right? And he was going through a hard time. His wife had some sin in her life. It kind of came out. He confronted her about it, and she literally couldn't care less, like not even an ounce of repentance, right? So we, were, we, we spent that day basically, you know, praying and, and, and just talking to each other, encouraging each other, and it was just basically about how important it is that we have to constantly be in a state of repentance. We can never take our eyes off of repentance, right? And I get it, right? Because, like, you know, everybody has sin in their life. Right. Like every single one of us, no one's exempt of that. Um, and, I, and I'm not saying that any of us are any better than that guy's wife because we all struggle with things. But I'm going to tell you, like, when you when you're stubborn to repentance, when you're cold to repentance, when you are rejecting, when the Holy Spirit is pointing out areas of your life and asking you that, that you need to repent of this and you're stubborn to it. Well, that, that's a whole other sin. That's a whole different sin. And it's very, very it's a dangerous place to be. So one of the things that we should be focusing upon in this, in this fast is that we need a pure Holy Spirit, a pure relationship with our Holy Spirit. We need it to be so active in our life that when the Holy Spirit tells us to do something or when the Holy Spirit tells us to not do something, that we listen. That's what we should be focused on. So my question is, is are you quick to repent? When you have things in your life that the Holy Spirit is poking at you about, like, are you quick to repent? When God points out areas where you, that he is displeased, right? And he knows that's not in line with how he's calling you to live. He's not, it's not in line with what he wants for you. Are you willing to repent? Because we need that to have a pure oil, right? Because I, I will tell you, you know, we have to be quick to repent. Because it's only that repentance that will reconcile us to be back in his presence. That's the only, you want to know if that could be a very strong reason on why your lamp is not bright. It could be a reason why your lamp is not on at all. It burnt out, right? So we need to make sure that our oil is pure. We need to make sure that we have submission to the Holy Spirit. We need to make sure that our eyes are pure. Our ears are pure. Our devotion is pure. Our prayer is pure. We have to make sure that our relationships are pure. Every aspect of your life, pure. And I'm going to tell you, it reminds me of this great story. I'm a huge advocate of family life. Um, they're, they're a nonprofit ministry. They're all about families and building families and healthy families and all this sort of stuff. 
And I remember um, they had a guy who was sharing his story about how he became a part of Family Life. And he said that, you know, he was going to be part of their speaker team. He was going to start doing their conferences and stuff. And they flew him and his wife out to go meet with, like, the, the founder and CEO of, like, Family Life. So he's like, look, I was nervous. Family life's a big deal. I was really excited for this opportunity. And I kind of get there and I'm thinking like I'm studying and I'm like, what's he going to ask me? Maybe he's going to quiz me on the Bible. And maybe he's going to do this and this and this and this and this and this. He's like, we finally we get off the plane. We go to the head office. We get there. We sit in front of him. I'm sitting across this, uh, the desk from him and he just looks at me. He's all, the, the whole interview process. He asked me one question. He said, are you pure? It's the only question, right? He said he looked deep in my soul. He said, are you pure? He said, yes, I'm pure. Then he says, okay. And then he took his eyes off of me and then he looked at my wife. And he asked her, is he pure? And she said, yes, he's pure. He says, okay, we're good then. Like you have the position. Right? And I said, and it blew his mind, right? That that was like the one thing, you know, the interview was only, got the position, that was the only thing he cared about. Like if he was pure. There's nothing more important than being pure and being clean. Because when you're pure, everything else works out. All other, all other problems, I'm not saying there's not gonna be problems, but problems will come to pass, right? You know, the waves will come, the waves will cease, the you know, tribulations will come, tribulations, but that's okay if you're pure, right? So one of the things that I'm gonna challenge you guys for the next you know, five weeks of this fast is let this fast be pure. Let this be a focus of your fast. That, like, I want to be pure, right? Like, this is not just about food. I want to challenge you to something way outside of food. And I know that we focus a lot on food, but be pure in your diet, right? And I'll be honest with you, be pure, sorry, be pure in your fast. And does that also entail your diet? Yeah, without, without a doubt, right? And I'm going to tell you, you could, be, you could be fasting to the letter of the law and your, your stomach is full every night with mecorona. How do you think that's going to treat your fast? It's not going to do well right? You know, you're, be pure with your prayer. Be pure in your Bible readings, your submission to the Holy Spirit, your repentance, what you watch, where you go. Like all of that should be a part of your fast. None of that is exempt of your fast. So be pure for the coming weeks, right? Like let your fast be pure. And I love this part because a lot of us are be like, yeah, I would love to be pure, Pete, but how? How do I be pure, right? Well, where did the pure oil come from? You know, again, I'm going to read it. it says, and you should command the children of Israel that they bring pure oil of pressed olives for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually. We must be pressed. It's the only way. The only way is for us to be pressed. Do you think the process of bringing the oil out of the olive was a pleasant process? Do you think it was enjoyable to the olive? Of course not. You know, you look at one of the purest examples in the New Testament is St. Paul. We, we all agree that St. Paul was pure, a thousand percent, right? Ministered to half the world. Mo wrote more than half the New Testament. And I love what he says in 2 Corinthians 8. He says, for we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. Why was he able to do what he was able to do? Because he was pressed. Beautiful things come from being pressed. We see God when we are pressed, and I think if you're honest with yourself, and I asked you, did you see, have you seen God's hands more when you're pressed or when you're comfortable? It's always pressed, always pressed. And isn't that what fasting is all about? Fasting all of ourselves, it's a voluntary pressing that we are putting ourselves into, that we are pressing down on our flesh so that our spirit can thrive. And in learning that through fasting, we all learn more self-control as well. Could you use a little bit more self-control? I can use a little bit more self-control. You know, I remember years ago, God, it must have been over 10 years ago, I remember the first time I read the Pope's book, Pope Shenouda's book on the spirituality of fasting. It really challenged me in, in a ton of different ways. The first time I've, I'd, I've ever, you know, really had like a motivation to fast because he spoke about it so real and the benefits so real. Um, first time that I ever t learned that there, there's a beauty in actually having hunger, like physical hunger during your fast. Because a lot of the times we are fasting dietarily, but our stomachs are full. And I remember in that book, he said, challenge yourself, right? He's like, look, you should be abstaining every day. Like if, you, if you're telling yourself, look, you know, maybe you're going to start at like nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. He's all, push it out. 
right? And I'm not talking about intermittent fasting because I know that that's popular, right? But I'm talking about like, no, for spiritual reasons, you push it out. And he says, look, if you're abstaining until 12 o'clock and it's 12 o'clock and you, and you, you, you get your food and you have it in front of you, he's all stare at it for 15 minutes. Teach yourself, teach yourself to say no to what's right in front of you, right? Like really push yourself even after you achieve what you were supposed to achieve, push yourself a little bit further, right? Control your flesh, you know, and, and he, he spoke about this beautiful aspect of allowing yourself to be hungry will develop a sense of humility. And it's one of those things, and this is why we read, like, you know, the fathers and, and spiritual books and, and things like that, because of the fact that you would never put those two together. You would never think, if I need to be more humble, then I need to be more hungry. But I realize that it's true. And he says that, a, you know, a man with an empty stomach will never have a proud spirit. And there's so much truth to that, but we don't put those things together. And it's, it's hard to be proud when your stomach is growling. But none of us will ever get there, right? So we need to be pressed when we fast. We need to be pressed so we can understand that that is the only way that we can achieve that pure oil, right? St. Paul had pure oil. And I believe it was because he pushed himself, not only because he pushed himself as well, but it also says that on, on three different occasions, he asked God, remove the thorn from my flesh. And God says, no, you're, you're okay. My grace is made perfect in your weakness, right? That thorn in his flesh pressed him and brought out of him a great oil. And I'm going to tell you guys again, if the, the same way that we should deny ourselves physically is the same way that we need to feed ourselves spiritually. We've got five weeks left and I hear all of the people all of the time that say, I just don't benefit from fasting, right? Like I don't see the upside of it. And I want to sit with them and I want to be like, okay, well, let's talk about this then. Tell me what you're not eating, right? And we can, we can start there, right? But then I also want to spend some time on what are you doing? It's not enough to, to abstain from like the meat and dairy products because that in itself will never get it done. I'm going to challenge you and tell you it's more about what are you doing? Right? Have you increased your prayer? Have you increased your Bible reading? Do you have a new standard to hold yourself to, to push yourself in a way that you can get, that you can get growth? Because a lot of us want the growth without the pushing, and it will never happen. So make, make no mistake about it. Like Fasting has power. And I pray that every single one of us in this room, that by the end of this fast, you'll be able to say that I, I felt the power. I saw the power right? That when I started fasting the right way, I noticed that I started having self-control. I noticed I could start overcoming some things that I might've been weak to before, right? I want to see that like, hey, even though I implemented the self-control in one aspect of my life, I started seeing all of this development in other aspects of my life. I want to be able to hear from you guys that like, hey, God's guidance became more real, right? I started to hear what God was telling me to do and have the ability to submit to his Holy Spirit, Right, that we can say that I said no to temptation, that, that we could say that we fought the sin, right? Because there's one thing that biblically fasting is power. It reminds me of a story. If you guys know Abuna Gargios from St. John, I remember one time we were sitting with him. You know, sounds this great story. He was a priest in Egypt living in his, uh, in his building, and he, he was having dinner. So one of his neighbors comes and they said, Abuna, we have, we have like <laughs> someone's demon possessed, like in the apartment upstairs. Can you come? Right? So Abuna's like, uh, okay, I'll be up in a little bit, right? So he does what he needs to do, goes upstairs, and he goes to cast out this demon. And he's sitting and he starts praying on this demon. And he says, literally, the demon laughed at him and said, do you think that you're going to come up here with a full stomach and cast me out? Just like that. And I was like, Abuna, what would you do? And he's like, oh, it's easy. I fasted, and the next day I went out, and I took the demon out. Just like that right? He's like, there's a power in fasting. There's a power in fasting. And, and here's the thing in, in, our, in our prayer and what I want us all to be thinking about, right, is we want the lamp to burn continually. Like, why do we talk about this stuff, right? We talk about this stuff because we want, like, we love the presence of God. We, see, we love seeing God show up in our life. We love, you know, everything about that. But if we were honest with ourselves, it doesn't happen continually, Right? We have our highs, we have our lows, we have our good times, our bad times, our times where we're focused on him, and then the other times we're distracted by the world. Right? But the desire is for us, hopefully, to all have it burn continually. Um, this isn't just a fast. Right? Like We are building character here. 
We're burning, uh, we are building spiritual like applications. We're building. So God's desire for us is never to be on and off. He needs us to be burning continually. And for our sake, we need to be burning continually. And I, I, when we pick up on of these things, right, we will start realizing that we're going to stop all of these up and down cycles in our life. I remember one time um, I had one of my spiritual mentors and he was staying with us and it was like a Tuesday and Christina prepared all of this food and, and he was coming over and then we have like this full like spread of food and we said eat and he was just like, oh, I'm fasting. And I'm like, it's Tuesday. <laughs> Who fasts on Tuesdays? And he's like, no, I fast whenever I need it, right? Like it's not Wednesday, it's not Friday. I fast whenever I need it. Right? And I'm hoping that's something that we can pick up because of the fact that we want our oil to continually burn. Um, so I'm going to tell you, this is the good news. If this has not been your experience for the last three weeks, it can definitely be your experience for the next five. And I believe a lot of the times there are certain things that I say. I say when we pray in line with God's heart, then it's layup. Like he will grant you, he will grant you your prayers. And I'm going to tell you that there's one person who wants you to benefit from your fast more than you do. And it's our heavenly father. And I pray that if we, if we commit to this, right, I know that God is willing and I know that he's willing to bless your fast, but he's looking for change from us that we can transform the way that we are looking at it as well. We still have time. We've, we've, we've had three. We still have five to go. We still have a time for a lot of growth. And don't miss the opportunity to really exp experience the benefits of fasting. Because I'm going to tell you that however you benefit of the fast, that is exactly how you're going to benefit from the resurrection. Hand in hand. Because there's no resurrection without death. And I think a lot of us, and, I, and I've talked about this a thousand times, want to know why we don't have the power of the resurrection in our life? Because we never learned how to die. And this is a perfect opportunity to. Amen? All right, let's stand up and pray. And I beat the kids. Actually, I, <laughs> I thought for sure they were going to beat me up here. I'm two minutes over. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, I thank you, Lord. I thank you because this is a timely message, Lord. And I know that it is out of your heart and out of your love for us, Lord, that you, that you prepare this message. So, Lord, I ask that you just stir up that desire inside of us, Lord, to really just commit to these next five weeks. Lord, to really just teach us how to fast. So I, I'll tell you, I'll be the first one to say, Lord, that I don't have all of the answers, but I trust in your guidance, Lord. I trust in the Holy Spirit will tell me what to do. I, I trust, Lord, that when we turn our eyes towards you, Lord, that you don't disappoint us, Lord, because you've always been faithful, even when we are faithless. So I ask that you just hold our hands for the next five weeks, Lord, that you walk us through this. I ask that you allow us to see a side of you that we previously may not have ever seen, Lord but your love and your care and your guidance, Lord, and the way that you are for us, the way that you are for intimacy with us, Lord, just to reveal yourself to us. So I ask that you just clear, you clear out all of the distractions, Lord, even if the distraction is our own self, Lord, that we can benefit from having that true intimacy with you. I ask that you have mercy on this group, Lord. I ask that your just presence just reign over, Lord, not, not just when we're in the walls of this church, Lord, but I ask that you follow every single one of us home, Lord, whether we invite you or not, that you could be seen in every day of our life, that our lamps may burn continuously. And I ask this session of all your saints from our chairs. Here's what we pray with one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.